pray. I'd like us to turn now in our Bibles to the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, and during these Sundays in Lent, we're making our way through a chapter at a time, the Last Supper, and the instructions that Jesus gave prior to his passion, his death and resurrection. We're looking at a very significant promise today, Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit, and that promise is made to all who believe. We'll start with verse 15, where Jesus said, If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace, I leave you to you. My peace, I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You have heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to, uh, going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us know. May God's Spirit in us verify the truth of these words and confirm them in us so that we may live accordingly. Now, if you've been one of the people watching the Olympics for the last 18 days, You've been treated to some of the most amazing athletic performances, but one of the biggest controversies of this game may be an Olympic skier who became an internet sensation because of her horrible performances. Have you read about this? Hungarian skier Elizabeth Swaney is the subject of some angry athlete social media posts accusing Swaney of scamming her way into the Olympics. Swaney became a sensation when she came in last place in the women's ski half fight for Team Hungary. She was unable to complete even the most basic tricks, but did succeed at not falling down. So I have to give her props for that. I tried skiing once and I couldn't get up the 
T-ball, let alone come down the hill without falling down. In an interview, Swain said she's capable of landing tricks on water ski ramps, but she said, quote, I just haven't been comfortable enough yet to land these tricks on snow. Well, you may wonder why she's there then. Swain's grandparents are from Hungary, which allowed her to compete for that team. So that's loophole number one in the rules. The other loophole was that Sweeney competed in World Cup events and finished in the top 30 by going to events that had less than 30 competitors. <laughs> that's the other loophole. So she was able to accumulate enough points to qualify for the Olympics, even though she doesn't do any of the tricks or stunts that make the, that event so exciting. Well, let me tell you some good news this morning. There will be no scamming in the heaven. There are no loopholes to exploit. There's no way to cheat. There's no fooling God who knows our hearts. Everyone who is in heaven will be there because they walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Just as we do in the snow. You, know, you follow your footsteps. Just as we do. They received his gift of salvation by faith. They've been adopted into God's family, have shown God's love, and followed the guidance of God's Holy Spirit. Everyone in heaven will be fully qualified by God. Which leads us to today's passage. We follow God by means of the Holy Spirit who leads us in loving. We're going to look at uh, three points today, the first of which is this, our love for God is manifest in obedience. Our love for God, we show it by obeying Jesus. Now, this is going to be real difficult to miss in this passage because Jesus says it three different places in three slightly different ways. Verses 15, 21, and 23 to 24. So as we look at this, the first thing I want us to know is that the word if is a little word with big implications. If, I am. Little word, big implications. With it, Jesus effectively says, you can claim whatever you love, but those who do love follow my commands. Pretty straightforward. Obedience is keeping God's commands to love. So, you see how this works? We show our love by obeying, and we obey by loving. You remember the order of those commandments? Who do we love first? God. Who do we love second? Others. Who's third? Very good. God. Others, self. Let's notice secondly then that the love of God is manifest in the Holy Spirit. How does God show that He loves us? He gives us His Holy Spirit. Okay, how do we get that Spirit? Jesus says it's through Him. We get the Holy Spirit through our faith in Jesus. He said very plainly in verse 16. I will ask the Father. He will send you the Spirit. So, because Jesus asked for it, we receive the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus teach about the Holy Spirit in this passage? Well, the first one is that the Holy Spirit is another counselor. Another counselor. Now, in the original language, that word counselor is paraclete. And no, we're not talking about the little bird in the cage. That's very key. Paraclete is a word that is really hard to translate into English because it's so rich with meaning. One way you can kind of get at it is that if your very best friend was Bill Gates, that would kind of get at it. The word counselor means someone who can help you completely, and loves you completely. 
someone uh, that is your comforter, your helper, your advocate, your teacher, your mediator, legal advisor, intercessor, and friend. Wow. That's what the Holy Spirit is to us. But he is also the spirit of truth. This is the second thing. The spirit of truth. Look at verse 17. The promise here is that the spirit will lead us into all truth. It doesn't say that all people will accept that as true. But the spirit will remind us of everything that Jesus has taught. He will bring to mind scripture. He will cause us to remember teaching. And he will give us the words when the words are needed. Now, our culture is increasingly hostile to two things that are central to our faith. One is that there is such a thing as absolute truth. And two, that God has revealed it in Jesus Christ. The spirit of truth makes that point. The third thing Jesus tells us about the Holy Spirit is that the world cannot know him. The world cannot know him. Now, when John writes in his gospel or in his letters and he uses the word world, he's not referring to planet Earth. He's referring instead to something spiritual, something ethical. And it is a system of thought and belief and action that is antagonistic to God, that is contrary to God and to his people. And that's why... Later on, Jesus will call the devil the prince of this world. The world cannot know him because the spirit exists as a spirit. The spirit cannot be perceived by the five senses. And the part of the world's doctrine is that you can only believe what you can perceive with your five senses. But the word of God tells us that there's more to this than eyeballs and ears. Satan, in verse 30, as I said, is identified as the prince of this world, and he exerts his influence to oppose God and God's people. But notice what Jesus says. He has no hold on me. Like no deal. I got no strings on him. The devil has no hold on Jesus. So, what Jesus does, he does at the direction of God the Father. He does in the power of the Holy Spirit and in truth. But the world cannot see him because they have rejected him. That system has rejected Jesus. Fourth thing that Jesus tells us about the Holy Spirit is that he lives in Jesus' followers. He lives in Jesus' followers disciples. He lives in Jesus' people. Look at verse 17. What did Jesus say there to the disciples? You know him. The world doesn't, but you know him. Because you have faith in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that the Spirit lives in you and will be in you. God has chosen to partner with his people in order to share the good news with folks who have not yet received it. Think about it, folks. God doesn't speak aloud. God doesn't appear in person. Who speaks aloud? Who appears in person? It's you and I. He's chosen to partner with us in this way. Number five, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. That's verse 26. He will teach you all things. He will remind you of everything. Let's look at those three words real quick. Teach. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand the teachings of Jesus. Here's the mental part. Paul said that our minds must be renewed. So there is some thinking. There is some learning that is always a part of the Christian faith. He said also that he will remind you and that word is there to show us that knowledge does not exist for knowledge's sake, but for a purpose, a higher purpose, a greater meaning to life. And so we're reminded of these things so we can put them into practice. This isn't about learning how to play 
writing checkers and then never touching a checkerboard. It's learning how to be a believer and then going out and doing it. And then the word everything. This promise is unconditional. You can bank on it. You can trust in it. The Holy Spirit will all provide all that we need to keep all of God's commands. Now let's look at verse or the third point here. Jesus comforts us by making promises to us. And there are some wonderful promises in this passage, aren't there? We're going to look at those very briefly. The first of these comforts, these promises, is in verse 18, where Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I believe that this promise is going to be fulfilled in its entirety at the second coming of Jesus. He's going to appear, friends, and we're going to join him in our forever home. So instead of being orphans, or instead of being treated like orphans, we have been adopted into God's family. More than that, Jesus said, look at verse 20, we are one with him, and he is one with the Father, and so we are all together in <clears throat> Second word of comfort, and the second promise is, you will see me. This is in verse 19, and also verses 28 to 31. Verse 19 is a promise said in Jesus' day. He said, before long, the world won't see me anymore. What did he mean there? He said, they won't physically see me. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to leave this world. I'm going to go back to heaven. I'm going to be at the right hand of God the Father. But he said to his disciples, you will see me. Write down 1 Corinthians 15, 6. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. In that passage, Paul says that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of his followers. 500 of his followers. After he died and rose again, he appeared to them and more than 500 of them over the score of 40 days. But in a broader scope, it also is a promise to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, that we will see him in the clouds and we will be with the Lord forever. Verses 28 to 31 are a promise good for our day as well. Jesus says his departure is good news because the Spirit will come in his place. So Jesus went back to heaven and asked the Father, and the Father sent the Holy Spirit to all who will believe. Jesus said, I have told you now, so that when it happens, you will believe. This is word for word almost what we read last week in chapter 13, verse 19. So part of Jesus' mission here is to get these disciples, these 11 guys, ready for these extraordinary events that are about to happen. He knows their world is going to get turned upside down, and he wants them to believe, at the end of the day, to trust him and believe. Now, the point of all this is in verse 31. Here's our key. This happens, and Jesus spoke these words so that the world, remember, which is the system of evil, would learn that I love the Father and I do exactly what my Father has commanded. Jesus said, I want this truth to be so obvious, so evident, that even the most corrupted person, even the most worldly person, would be able to understand at least that. And then third, Here's a promise. Because I live, Jesus said. Because I live, you also will live. Verse 19. First Corinthians 15, 20 identifies Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection. And the first fruits is a biblical concept that talks about the very first part of the harvest. So you go out and harvest your field of corn and you take 
part of that crop, the first fruits, and you offer it to God. Now, what's the difference between the corn in that part of the field and the corn in the other part of the field? Right? There's none. And so this truth links Jesus' resurrection with ours. And as he was raised, we will be raised. As he lives, we will live eternally. Because Jesus won the victory over death and lives forever, so will we. Here's the fourth promise. Fellowship with the Father. Fellowship with the Father. We refer to it already. It's in verse 20. But I want to throw that word Trinity in here because this is what we believe as Christians is that God is three persons in one. Now, we don't come to that belief because it's easy. We come to that belief because the Bible affirms that God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Spirit is God, but there's only one God. Work it out. We have to have a doctrine like the Trinity that says that this is who God is. Now, let me tell you why that's important. That means that God is in community himself. God didn't create us because he needed us. God didn't make us because we were lonely. God made us to love us, to be the object of his love. And when we come to Jesus Christ, we don't become gods, but we get to be part of that. We get to be part of that ultimate community. Now, I have to apologize to you. There's two more sub points here. This looks like I'm making stuff up and just jamming it in here, but no, it's just a mistake in your bulletin. So we're going to do E and F as well. Okay? Letter E. I will. Here's another promise. Who wouldn't want more promises? Right? Letter E. I will love and show myself to you. Verse 21. Love is the divine standard for relationships. It's what brings us into relationship with each other. And friends, love is why Jesus did it. comes down to that. Love is why Jesus gives us his spirit. Letter F. My peace I give to you. Verse 27. My peace I give to you. I don't, I don't give as the world gives. What does the world give? The world gives discord and division and competition and hatred and the little gaps in between them we call peace. Not good. Jesus said, my peace, I give you. It's a peace that banishes troubles and fears from our hearts. It's a peace that exists in spite of the circumstances if necessary, not because of So what we've seen today, friends, is that the Holy Spirit gives us leadership in love. Jesus spent the last hours before his arrest preparing to the disciples to live in a world that would be upside down. He predicted the events of the next few days so that his 11 guys would be ready to trust him to fulfill all God's promises. Today, these words serve a similar function for you and I. Jesus' words prepare us to live in the world, a system dominated by evil that is hostile to the truth. The very best thing that you and I have to counter that system is love. It's not being able to argue. It's not being able to prove a point is love. Love will win the day. And the best source of love is the Holy Spirit. Let us live in love. Let us live in God. Let us follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. We're going to turn in our songbooks to number 210, and as we sing, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the very God of whom we have been speaking. If you have felt God's touch upon your heart today, 
you're ready to take a step of faith. You're ready to step out literally and come forward, be it for baptism, salvation, membership.